Hello, everyone. We'll give uh, everybody else a few minutes here to get started. Uh, so hopefully we can start on time or very close to it. I see we have quite a few of our uh, uh, members and also others who like to attend the meetings. So we'll give them another um, couple of minutes to, uh, to log into the meeting and we'll get started. Okay, it is uh, 531 and we're going to start with, I'll be uh, chairing here very temporarily to take the role and to conduct us through the selection of a temporary chair. And uh, then we will move on from there to the electing of other officers for the LSC and other pieces of business as we go along through our agenda. Um, Again, please unmute and uh, say aye or if you are present. Uh, Kim Bowman. Present. Denia Boyd. Present. Thank you. Uh, Elaine Bugs. Present. Cassie Cresswell. Present. Jose Hernandez. Jose Hernandez. Okay. Uh, Troy Hillbrands. Here. Sarah Ma. Here. Ellen Martinsek. Here. Latrice MacArthur. Here. Roberto Menavar. Present. Uh, Joseph Powers is present. Rachel Zine. Present. Rachel? Uh, present. Oh, there you are. I see you. Okay, you're present. Very good. Thank you very much. If Mr. Hernandez. Uh, uh, pops up there, please let me know and we'll mark him as present. Okay, the next order of business is the selection of a temporary chair. 
Uh, this is done by nomination and vote. And then that person serves as the temporary chair for meeting up to the time uh, we select a uh, permanent chair for the LSC. So the floor is open for nominations for the temporary chair for the organizational meeting. Hi, uh, I'd like to nominate Sarah Ma to start us off. As sure, that's, that's fine, I accept. Uh, do we have a second for that nomination? I second. Uh, I second that nomination. I'm sorry, Rachel. Very good. Do we have any other nominations for the role of temporary chair? I would actually like to uh, nominate Elaine Bugs. Okay. Elaine, is that all right with you? Latrice, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to have to decline. All right, thank you very much. Are there any other nominations for the role of temporary chair? I guess I'll call the, or Dr. Pars, do you want to call it for a roll call? Uh, I will do that. I'm still okay. chairing the meeting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not much, but it's all I true, have. True, true. Uh, there being no other nominations, we will, and the motion have, was seconded for the nomination of Sarah Ma as the temporary chair. So we will vote for the roll call. Um, yay or nay will be the response. Kim Bowman. Yay. Denia Boyd. Yay. Elaine Bugs. Yay. Uh, Cassandra Cresswell. Yay. Jose Hernandez. Uh, Troy Hillbrands. Yay. Sarah Ma. Yay. Ellen Martinsek. Yay. Latrice MacArthur. Yay. Roberto Menavar. Roberto? Oh, my apologies, Dr. Powers, that's a yay. Uh, myself, yay. Rachel Zein. Yay. Rachel, while I have you, is that a correct pronunciation of your last name? It's, uh, it's Zen. Zen, okay, very good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, uh, then our temporary chair by a vote of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, with no nay votes and no abstentions. Um, Sarah Ma is now the serving as chair of the temporary chair for the meeting this evening. I'll pass the gavel on to Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Powers. At this time, we'd like to select a temporary secretary for the organizational meeting. Are there any nominations for a temporary secretary? Um, I guess I would I would nominate Ms. Martinsek um, as a temporary secretary for the meeting. I would there second any... that. Thank you. Dr. Powers, second. Any discussion? No one likes to be the secretary. <laughs> um, I'll take a roll call vote, or I guess, sure, a roll call vote for the nomination of Ms. Martinsek to be the temporary secretary. Uh, Ms. Bowman? Yay. Ms. Boyd? Yay. Ms. Bugs? Yay. Ms. Cresswell? Yay. Mr. Hillbrands? Yay. Myself is a yay. Ms. Martinsek? Yay. Ms. MacArthur? Yay. Mr. Manivar? Yay. Dr. Powers? Yay. Ms. Zen? Yay. I miss, I'm sorry, I missed Mr. Hernandez. I, I saw that he joined the call. Right. I did. Uh, my vote is yay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. So I'll mark down Mr. Hernandez. So that were 12 yays for Ms. Martinsek as temporary chairperson out of 12. 
Um, I'd like to proceed to, sorry, um, the approval of the agenda. Um, I would actually like to make a motion that's okay to approve. Um, yes, Madam Mr. Chair, may I point of clarification, can we just acknowledge that Mr. Jose Hernandez has joined uh, the yes. LSE? Thank you. Yes, and I think he joined at 535 according to the chat. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Manivar. Um, as I was saying, I, I would like to make a motion to amend the agenda to, um, and I, I don't know, Troy, if you're able to share your screen and share the agenda with everyone um, so they could actually see. If not, I could, that would, thank you so much. Um, so if you scroll down, I would just like to amend, I'm making a motion to amend the agenda to add a reopening discussion to new business before the new business item Jones LSC bylaws. Oh, it's not on there. Okay, so I have a, I'm sorry, I have a different agenda. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's assume this is the appropriate agenda. Um, I guess I'm gonna make multiple motions unless, is this the correct agenda, Dr. Powers? Can you confirm? You're muted. I beg your pardon. No, that is not the correct agenda. It has been updated. Let me see if I can um, share. I'm not very adept at this. It's okay. Here we go, share screen. Try that again. Yes, and to your point, Cassie, in the chat, yes, we can make one motion to do multiple agenda amendments. However, if we, I don't believe I have more than one. Um, Dr. Powers, if you could just scroll down so I could see the section of new business. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not, can't even see the agenda. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, no, all I can see are the participants. I don't see the agenda. Okay, we, we that, see your, visible? we do see your agenda, yes. Okay, uh, if it is visible, then uh, the only difference between this and the agenda that was up previously was under new business, there was the Jones LSC bylaws and the rules of order. And your uh, request is to amend the agenda to add the reopening of school as an item under new business. Yes, preceding and, the bylaws. Right, discussion. and if I could just point out that as also in my principal's report. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, just in case we don't cover everything in your report, um, <clears throat> I think it's hot on everyone's mind. So mm -hmm. I think it would be good to for procedural reasons, have it in the new business section. That would be appreciated. So I'll just restate the motion. Um, I'm making a motion to amend the agenda to add reopening discussion to new business before the new business item Jones LSC bylaws. Are there any seconds? Second. Second. Oh. I think I heard Ms. Madam Bum Chair, Ms. Madam Acting Chair, can I have a point of clarification? Uh, regarding the um, amendment here? Yes. Uh, so this is to allow public participation for the reopening of the school, is that correct? Um, I, I can change it to be reopening and public participation discussion. I mean, in my sense, discussion meant that it would include public participation, but for clarification, I think that's a good idea to add reopening and public we're opening the discussion with, with public participation. Would that be satisfactory? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, so let me restate the motion. Um, I make a motion to amend the agenda to add reopening discussion with public participation to new business before the new business item Jones LSC bylaws. Do I have a second? I second that. <laughs> it's Roberto Mendebar. 
Roberta is making me type to type the names twice or making the secretary type the, the names twice. Um, okay. Mr. Many of our seconded the motion, I'll call for roll call vote. Um, is there any, does anyone have any discussion before we go for vote? I'll take the silence as no discussion. Do a roll call vote, Miss Bugs. Yay. Miss Bowman. Yay. Miss Boyd. Yay. Miss Cresswell. Yay. Mr. Hernandez. Yay. Miss Hilbert. Mr. Hilburns. Excuse me. Yay. Miss Ma. Myself. Yay. Miss Martinsek. Yay. Miss MacArthur. Yay. Mr. Menivar. Yay. Dr. Powers. Yay. Ms. Zen. Yay. Let it be noted there were 12 yays and zero nays and the agenda was amended with 12 out of 12 votes. Next item is approval of minutes. All LSC members have received the draft minutes from the December 8th meeting as submitted by the secretary at that time was Ms. Martinsek. Mm. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? A second. Mr. Hillbrand seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, yes, there's a, a minor change, uh, Madam Chair. This is Roberto Medjavar. Okay. So in the public participation, uh, I believe it, um, I'm quoted as saying the ILT, uh, it, it's supposed to be the PPLC. Ellen, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, quoted, at, so we would like to, to change um, quote from Mr. Menivar to, to, to for PPLC in, instead of ILT. Um, okay. This is where I'm going to get procedurally. You guys are going to have to help me out. Um, I believe that we need to. Make the make a motion, Dr. Powers. You might need to help me out. If we do, do we have to kill that um, previous motion and then make a motion to approve the minutes with the change? Well, we have we have a motion to already with Mr. Menivar's uh, uh, correction or change in the agenda. That is the motion. Okay. In effect, so we need a second. If we've already gotten a second, that is fine. And then we vote on the uh, amended agenda. Okay, perfect. Or am amended minutes. Okay, so minutes, excuse me. Um, I'd like to make a motion then to approve the amended minutes. Um, do I have a second? In second. I second. Okay, that was Miss Martinsek. It's the Zoom uh, race. <laughs> I'll do a roll call vote for. The approval of the amended minutes. Um, Ms. Bugs? Abstain. Abstaining. Um, Ms. Bowman? Aye. Yay. Ms. Boyd? Yay. Ms. Cresswell? Yay. Mr. Hernandez? Yay. Mr. Hillbrands? Yay. Ms. Ma, myself, is a yay. Ms. Martinsek? Yay. Ms. MacArthur? Yay. Mr. Manivar? Yay. Dr. Powers? Doctor, yeah, Dr. Powers. I beg your pardon, I was on mute. I was muted. That's Yay. Thank you. Ms. Zen? Yay. Okay, let it show the record that there were one abstain and 11 yeas and the amended minutes are approved. Okay, this is the fun part. We're so serious. <laughs> um, I'd like to take nominations for the selection of the, the chairperson for the 2021 six month term LSCs. Are there any nominations for chair? Madam Chair, I'd like to be recognized and nominate uh, Ms. Cassie Creswell as chair for the Jones Local School Council. Do we have any seconds for that? 
I second. Ms. Boyd seconded. Um, are there any discussion or any other nominations? Can I uh, say something? Yes. Um, I, I don't know if it's appropriate that someone would be taking the chair that brought a lawsuit against the LSC. Uh, Ms. Cresswell, can you can you talk about your lawsuit a little bit? Um, the lawsuit's in the process of being settled, um, and uh, I think there's almost no overlap between this LSC and the old LSC. If we have any discussions uh, or um, if there's uh, issues, we will have a vice chair um, if it comes to uh, negotiating, um, but uh, it should be close to complete as far as I know. But I would certainly recuse myself from any discussion and uh, abstain from any votes. That Are you sense. allowed to tell the community what the lawsuit was about? Because I'm not sure everyone on this call knows. Um, yeah, it was a lawsuit uh, filed uh, to ask for um, documents from various uh, LSC meetings in the summer that I put in FOIA requests for that were refused. Um, and so, uh, and also um, some uh, Open Meetings Act violations. Um, and uh, the previous LSC uh, has agreed to settle. They released um, all the documents that were asked for um, and it should be close to being resolved. Um, does anyone else have any other? Uh, Madam, Madam Acting Chair, I do have a question <laughs> for Ms. Creswell about the lawsuit. Um, it's my understanding that the lawsuit was to um, invoke your right. Is that correct? Yes, under the Freedom of Information Act and the Open Meetings Act. Thank you. And then, uh, Madam Chair, if, if I may be recognized, I'd like to say a few words about Ms. Kras my nomination of uh, Ms. Cassie Craswell, if that's okay. Yes, and, and absolutely. And then I did see a note. Um, uh, there's a note in the chat, which I think is fair. It says, can we know why you wanted those copies? Um, I, if Cassie could answer that, and then if Roberto, I would love to hear you speak. And then when we're not speaking, if we could mute, there are um, some people getting some feedback in their, um, in their audio. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, my initial FOIA request was for the video recording in the chat um, for the July LSC listening session meeting, um, which during that meeting, it was emphasized greatly that this was going to be uh, made public for people who couldn't attend before the meeting. It was said that this was going to be you know, the most important LSC meeting of the year. Um, and really it is the position of the uh, Illinois Attorney General that audio recordings and video recordings need to be provided, uh, especially for these remote meetings. That's a, a new law um, that even the open sessions need to be uh, have recordings um, and under the Open Meetings Act, those then are public documents and we should have access to them. Um, and I really just thought it was an important record of what's going on in the Jones School community and that you know we, we can't uh, resolve and work through the issues that we're looking at unless we really, we all have access to the same information. Um, and these are public meetings and even though stuff is difficult that we discuss, I think it's just really important that we respect um, these laws as a public body. Mr. Manivar. Thank you. Um, so uh, I nominate um, Ms. Cassie Creswell as chair of the Jones uh, Local School Council because I believe Ms. Creswell's leadership and organizational experience with several parent advocacy groups such as uh, the Illinois Families for Public Education, Raise Your Hand, and more than a score demonstrates that she is capable and has the capacity to organize and empower groups of people and organizations to move forward for the public good. Uh, it is clear to me that Ms. Creswell believes that well-functioning local school councils should and can be a 
steward of school's culture and vision through collaboration and discourse. She also has shown a willingness to dig deeper into the issues, research process, and the role of school governance. On a personal level, uh, Ms. Creswell has displayed a willingness to connect and engage with others to better the school community for all. Uh, she was the first person as an LSE parent candidate during the LSE elections to reach out to me to ask about my views and more importantly about my personal journey and my experience at the Jones School uh, at the Jones School community as, as a parent and member of the Jones School community. Um, and that is that is the reason why I'm nominating uh, Cassie Creswell, Ms. Cassie Creswell as chair of the Jones Local School Council. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield the floor. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the floor for or against or for other nominees? Madam Chair, I I have a question. Yes, I'm just wondering, that's fine. <laughs> I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for um, Cassie to state with her um, briefly, her objective or goals are for in this role. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bugs. I think that would be great for all of us to hear. Thanks, Ms. Bugs. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, we, you know, I ran as part of a slate and we really tried to put together a platform so that people knew why we were running clearly. Um, and I think um, it's clear that we really need to work on issues of equity and racial injustice at Jones. Um, I think it's gonna be at the top of our agenda and really looking at everything that we can do um, as an LSC and really exercising our rights and our responsibilities as an LSC to push forward that cause um, of truly making Jones a school for every student um, where everyone feels like they belong. Um, and, uh, you know, secondly, I think, you know, as we've already talked about this lawsuit, really following uh, the, the duty of a public body to be open and transparent um, and make sure that we can share the information that we need to about the budget and the school improvement plan um, and uh, the principal evaluation process and just really making sure that we are pulling in all stakeholders um, and it's a collaborative LSC and it's one that is transparent and transparency really in the goal of equity um, because we really can't, we can't solve the stuff that's facing us without uh, making sure that we are public about it um, and that we hear from all stakeholders and that we, our deliberations are open. Um, and, you know, I think, I think those are the sort of the two top things. Um, and, you know, both of those really come down to making sure that the student body uh, is, we're doing the best for them. I mean, that's why we're all taking time out of our, our lives to volunteer for something like this. Um, and, you know, it's a big task. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the we is the LSC. And I, I think we're, it's really, I'm excited to work with a, a great group of local school council members. Um, and yeah. Thank you for sharing. I, you know, I just, I guess I have just one more question and that would be for Troy. Um, since you, you did, I, you brought it up about the lawsuit and I'm just wondering, if you feel like you'd be able to put that aside and like move forward um, as a collaborative group, um, obviously we, we value your input as a staff member, member at Jones. Um, just, you know, just wanted to hear what you had to say. Um, well, I, like I said, I certainly don't believe that putting a lawsuit against the very thing that you're running for is a great way to start. Um, I fully understand having documents appropriately posted. Um, I think there was a, a very tumultuous time during that period and there was a lot of confusion. There's a lot of changeover that happened and there may have been some oversights that caused those documents not to be available. Um, I know for myself, after every meeting that I participated taking over for um, transferring the videos over to the website, I'm working on that for six hours afterwards, trying to download a gigabyte of information. So 
for someone that is very new to the Zoom calls, um, I just thought it, there could have been a better way to do it. And it just didn't seem appropriate that someone would take that kind of action for the very group that they want to be a part of and make change. Okay, I think that's a fair comment. Um, I would say, Troy, that I'm looking forward to working with you because I have some ideas on how to make that your job so much easier um, as far as dealing with large videos and um, and we could definitely get in the, into that at another time. Um, I my, Myself personally, I, I think we can move forward um, unless there's more comments. Um, I've worked, I've known Cassie for a long time. Um, I mean, for many, many years, just through advocacy work. And if, and I always can count on her to um, do the work and to get stakeholder input. So I would never feel that she would unilaterally um, take over or do something like that. And, um, and so I, I just feel really confident that she can help to lead us in a way where we can really work together and, um, and, and serve the students the best. So is, is there any more discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the question, please. Okay. Okay, unless there's any more uh, debate, I'd like to take a, well, let's see. So just to restate, I believe Mr. Menivar made a motion to have Ms. Cresswell be the chair and Ms. Boyd seconded. So now I would take a roll call vote. Um, let me get my list here. Roll call vote, Ms. Bugs. Sarah. Yes. Just for clarification, did you uh, entertain whether there were any other people interested in being nominated prior I to would, the- uh, I, I mentioned it, but I would, would, I'll mention it again. Is there anyone else that would like to nominate someone else or be nominated? or nominate themselves, I guess, <laughs> to nominate someone else or, or to uh, nominate themselves. And that was just a point of clarification, just to know who is on, who we are all voting for, if there are other options. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, seeing none, my vote would be yay. Okay. So Ms. Bugs was a yay, Ms. Bowman. Yay. Ms. Boyd. Yay. Ms. Cresswell? Yay. Ms. Hernandez? Mr. Hernandez, I'm sorry. I need to put like, <laughs> I need to get rid of all gendered language. Mr. Hernandez. Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, yes, yay. Okay. Mr. Hillbrands? Nay. Ms. Ma is a yay. Ms. Martin Sex? Yay. Uh, Ms. MacArthur? Yay. Uh, Mr. Menivar. Yay. Dr. Powers? Abstain. Abstain. And Ms. Zen? Yay. Okay, so that was, for the record, it was 10 yays, one nay, and one abstain for Ms. Cresswell as chair. I am now happily turning over the chairperson work to, to Cassie. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just want to reiterate, we means the LSE as a whole. Um, and it really means the school community as a whole, um, because that is, that's who we represent. Um, that's why we have such a, that's how LSEs are built. That's why we have teachers, student, a student, the principal, um, non-teacher staff, parents, and community all together. Um, and that's really what we are supposed to be a collaborative body that is hearing from all stakeholders as we go ahead and make our decisions. Um, so I am, can't really see all of our modified agenda. So I'm gonna try to pull it up a little better here. Um, I could put it in the chat or maybe Dr. Powers could stop sharing his screen and you could share your screen, Cassie. Um, yeah, it's fine. I like, uh, that's always kind of a nightmare too, I think, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, I think I am good here. Um, yes. Okay, so uh, the next order of business um, is uh, nomination and selection uh, of a secretary. Um, and 
my, my Robert, Robert tools of order may be a little rusty. So, uh, but I will, am happy to uh, entertain nominations for secretary if someone wants to put one forth. Madam Chair, I'd like to nominate uh, Ellen Martinsek as secretary. Uh, Ellen? Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate the nomination, Dr. Powers. Um, I will be honest, I find it um, a little bit overwhelming to take minutes. So I'm actually going to decline at this time, but thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Ellen. Ellen. Thank you. Thank you so much for having uh, served as secretary. You've done a superb job. Thank you. Uh, okay. Any, any other nominations? Um, well, Madam Chair, I, I, I would like to nominate um, uh, Ms. Sarah Ma. I'll second that. Like, it's not, maybe, okay, maybe someone else should second. I don't know if the chair should really go around seconding if, if at all possible, but. I can second it. Um, no one loves to be secretary. I'm just coming off of being a secretary, so I'm not afraid. Um, I, I, I accept the nomination. Uh, on one condition that you all turn in reports in advance so that I can do the minutes more easily. I'm just kidding. I mean, that's, it's a non-conditional. It's just, it's just for fun. Um, yeah. Um, Madam Chair, if, if, if it would, um, uh, I'd like to be acknowledged on the floor. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I think it would be important to, uh, we have the public here, uh, to describe what the, the roles and responsibilities of the secretary, and it's not just uh, taking minutes. So if um, either Madam Chair would like to describe the role or if our nominee would like to describe the role. Um, I'll, Sarah, go ahead. Um, if you'd like to, since you've been a secretary before, that would be great. You know, I think it depends on each council, how much, what they want the secretary to do. But in my experience, one of the main things is taking the minutes um, and making sure that all of the council members have access to all the documentation that they need to review before the meeting, you know, ideally 48 to 72 hours before, and that my job has always been to make your life as easy as possible. So that would be either by putting all the documents in a public folder and also again, making sure that the documentation is easily accessible to all the stakeholders. Um, sometimes the secretary can do more work uh, with social media if, if the LSC wants to have a presence there. Uh, I would recommend that the social media is just for, for information only. So it would just be announcing meetings and sharing minutes, um, whatever you can do to broaden your reach so that you make it easier to get information. Um, and then the secretary, secretary supports the chair. So if the chair uh, needs help, with any documentation, um, the, the secretary can be there for that. And then the secretary is there to make sure everything is organized so that the FOIA OMA rep, um, their job is easy and they can uh, they know exactly where to, to get information if were there to be a FOIA or a, a FOIA request. Great, thanks. Um, does anyone else have any discussion of this or other nominations? Call for the question. Can we go for? Great. Um, okay, so I'll restate the, the motion is for uh, Sarah Ma as uh, secretary of the Jones LLC for this 2021 abbreviated session. Um, and Sarah, can you call? I'll, I'll call. So I, I think the secretary also does a roll call. <laughs> um, I'm trying to do it in a uh, in some semblance of order. I'm sorry if I, I've changed it, but I will try to do it alphabetical order. Um, okay, so Miss Miss um, Boyd, I guess it would. Yeah. Yay. Miss, yeah, Miss Bowman. Yay, although I'm happy not to be the first every time, so keep making mistakes. No, no, I, I'm fixing it the next <laughs> time. Miss <laughs> uh, Bugs. Yay. Miss Cresswell. Yay. Mr. Hernandez. Yay. Mr. Hellbrands. Yay. Ms. Ma, myself is yay. Ms. Martinsek. Yay. Ms. MacArthur. Yay. Mr. Manivar. Yay. Dr. Powers. 
Yay. Yay. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Zen? Yay. Let the record show there were 12 yays and zero nays. We'll move on to the next order of business is the nomination selection of a vice chair. Um, and do we have any nominations from the floor or self nominations? I have a nomination. Um, I would like to nominate uh, Mr. Hernandez. I'll second. You can't, you said you weren't seconding anymore. I so. know, but every so <laughs> Just wait, the Zoom, you'll get it. Just wait for the Zoom. Okay. <laughs> Give the, the Zoom pause. I'll second. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Denaya. Um, so uh, the motion um, is for uh, Jose Hernandez as vice chair. Um, and we can open up the floor for some discussion from LSC members uh, or other nominations. Um, I can talk. I can always talk. Um, I, I met Mr. Hernandez. He has a senior at Jones. I feel like for this abbreviated six month term, he's a perfect fit for a vice chair. He has extensive uh, experience on LSCs and he's he has experience um, at Jones that I do not have. So I would appreciate him as a, you know, as a parent, as a vice chair to take on that role. Uh, um, I have a question. Um, Jose, if you could just kind of explain a little bit about your, um, if, if any experience you have you're bringing to the LSC, I would really appreciate that. Sure. Uh, my daughter attended Calmeca Elementary or Calmeca Academy, and uh, I was there as a chair for a number of years. I have also served on the LSEAB as the um, vice chair there and as a regular member. Uh, let's see. I'm currently on the LSE at Kelly, Kelly High School, as a community rep also. Okay, thanks. Um, any other discussion? I'll entertain a, the motion here. Okay. Move the question, please. Okay, I'll take a roll call. Vote for Mr. Hernandez as vice chairperson. Chairperson, roll call vote. Bowman. Yay. Boyd. Yay. Bugs. Miss Bugs. It's. I'll. I'll just. I'll come back to her in a second. Miss Cresswell. Yay. Mr. Hernandez. Yay. Mr. Hillbrands. Yay. Miss Ma. Yay. Ms. Martinsack? Yay. Ms. MacArthur? Yay. Mr. Manivar? Yay. Dr. Powers? Yay. Ms. Zen? Yay. Ms. Bugs, are you available? Yay. I was having a problem um, unmuting myself. That's okay. Uh, let the record show that was 12 yays and zero nays. And I'm just gonna get a recording for those. I'm just kidding. <laughs> And I'll just press the names and then it will just read them out each time. Okay. Um, our next up is nominations and selection of the FOIA OMA chair. Um, and yeah, I, I'll give you a little blurb. We just talked about this. Um, the Freedom Information Act and the Open Meetings Act are both uh, Illinois state laws that regulate the workings of public bodies. Um, and so they regulate everything from um, CPS uh, to uh, state agencies um, and to most of the elected bodies um, besides the General Assembly in Illinois. Um, and so they just play a really important role so that we make sure that we all know what's going on and we have access to documents and we have access to meetings. Um, and so we're, you know, it's a, a super important part of making sure that we're public and open. So I will entertain motions. Uh, I'd like to nominate um, Roberto Menivar uh, for FOIA OMA rep. 
I'll second the motion. Thanks. Um, uh, and do we have any questions, discussion? Uh, maybe Roberto could just give us a little info about himself. Sure. Thank you so much, Ms. Ma. Uh, I do accept the nomination. Uh, my name is Roberto Mejibar. Uh, I have a sophomore at Jones, and uh, I have been attending the LSC since we became part of the Jones community in September 2019. I'd like to say to folks that uh, I would have had perfect attendance until we went to Zoom, and then I missed one Zoom call. Uh, so I have been involved, and in I think it's important to have uh, uh, representation uh, on the local school council and to really work for everyone, uh, work with everyone in the Jones School community and ensuring that we are abiding by the Open uh, Meeting Act um, and ensuring that we are transparent with every member uh, of the Jones School community and the public. That concludes discussion. If we can call a question. Call a question. Okay, so with respect for the motion of Mr. Many Virus for your OM ARUP, here is the roll call vote. Bowman. Yay. Boyd. Yay. Boggs. Yay. Cresswell. Yay. Hernandez. Yay. Hillbrands. Yay. Ma. Yay. Martin Sack. Yay. MacArthur. Ms. MacArthur? Yay. Menivar? Yay. Dr. Powers? Yay. Zen? Yay. Five were yay, zero were nays. Okay. Um, so that concludes the officer selection. Um, next, we will talk about the regular meeting schedule. Um, and so, uh, the previous LLC had set up meetings, um, and I think this is the, the time that we can talk about whether uh, this day of the week is good for people, whether this time slot is good for people, if people have a proposal on that, um, and also uh, whether we uh, should have a January regular meeting as well, since this is really the, the bulk of this is procedural this, tonight. So... Um, so I, I propose that we add a regular meeting next Tuesday, if at all possible, since this is our organizational meeting, uh, especially as we're onboarding the new LSA, I think it would be appropriate. So I propose January 19th. I do have, uh, I would propose, and I, I'm getting feedback on, from all the council, but I feel like 5.30 is a very early time. I realize that in, when you were in person, uh, that was good for staff as they were still right there and they could stay after. But now that we're remote, um, I find that 5.30 p.m. is an extremely difficult time to, to get uh, to the meeting on time. I think we might be able to engage more stakeholders with a, with a later time. Uh, I'm proposing a 6.30 p.m. time and I'm interested in hearing your feedback. M Madam Chair and LSC uh, members, I actually um, recommend that we stick with the suggested and proposed meeting dates and times. I actually was gonna say the same thing. I think that uh, we need to be respectful of, of people's times and the fact that this is a volunteer organization um, continuously to have multiple meetings. We had uh, two meetings in December um, and I understand about the remote learning, but hopefully that will be coming to an end. And so to avoid having to have another vote about the time again, once school is in session, I think that we should uh, keep the, the meeting dates and times the same. And I would agree with that as well. Um, I think we can certainly, the, the business that needs to be addressed can be addressed at the next meeting, the next uh, regularly scheduled meeting in February. Um, and I prefer, um, and I think this has been traditionally the case. Most people have preferred the 5.30 start time because as meetings sometimes get longer, it gets later and later into the evening. And for those of us who are, maybe have been on the job since 12 hours earlier than that, 
uh, it, it's a little bit more convenient to do the 530. Especially now as, as we're remote, it actually probably is a little bit easier for everyone, uh, even uh, more so than when it was in person. So I would recommend that we stay with the schedule and stay with the 530 meeting time. I would like to, to just say, um, I think there's a lot of um, things to sort out. Um, and so I do agree with the idea of adding a, a meeting next week. Um, there's This is mostly organizational and um, this week has been pretty tumultuous for, for the district. And I just think there's a lot that needs to be talked about still. I um, am split. So I would like to add a night, an extra meeting, but I wanna keep the 5.30 time. I think that parents with young kids also who have to put things to bed and things like that. I just feel like the 5.30 time is more of a compromise issue. Like if, if it was just teachers, like four would be great, but that doesn't make sense for everybody else. Um, and like Dr. Carter working at five o'clock in the morning, so it's a late night for me, but that's like selfish. So I'd, I would want to, to compromise on and keeping that 5.30, but I would like to add uh, a 19th meeting to discuss things like PPLC. If we, we aren't talking today, that'll be over two months then before our next like ability to speak. And there's other you know special groups that we might wanna hear from besides just the logistical stuff we're doing today. I'm sorry. Um, Madam Chair, this is Roberto Menjivar. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Creswell. Oh, so I'll just say that I think we can split this into two votes. So do weigh in on the time and then weigh in on the, uh, the meeting on the 19th. That would be great. And then we'll, we'll separate them into separate votes on the motion. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, so for, for me, I'm just going to discuss the two since we've been consolidating these two discussions. Uh, so for me, I think it is important to have the second meeting of the month. Uh, according to local school council relations, this organizational meeting typically happens over July when there is no school business happening. The students aren't there. Um, we are in, uh, in session with students and CPS now has a reopening, has reopened the schools and today's the second day. So I think it is incredibly important to have a regular meeting so we can talk in depth about how the reopening is happening after this week and to hear from the PPLC and then parents who have been sending their children to the Jones School, um, uh, to Jones uh, as part of the cluster program. And then if there are any additional approvals and budget approvals uh, and then minutes that we need to discuss those things uh, at, at another, at our regular meeting. Again, this is an annual organizational meeting where we're electing our officials or our officers and then setting the schedule and it's typically happened over July and due to the pandemic, it has caused a lot of uh, schedule uh, issues. And I think we need to get back on that regular schedule. And as far as the time, um, I would prefer, I, I, I totally respect everyone's uh, time. Uh, and as Dr. Powers has mentioned, I, Dr. Powers, I'm one of those individuals who works uh, on average 12 hour days. So, and I am downtown. So I, I understand the time issue. Um, for me, I think uh, as a compromise, um, I, it would, I would propose having a six o'clock, moving our 5.30 meetings to 6 p.m. Uh, I have taken a look at a handful of uh, local schools, uh, CPS local schools, and about 10 of them. And uh, from selective enrollment schools to neighborhood schools, from Northside, Walter Payton, to Whitney Young, and 99, 95% of them, their time start at six or 6.30. The only school that starts at 5.30, if I remember correctly, is Whitney Young. Uh, and this, is, this would just accommodate, um, I think, a variety of stakeholders if we move the time from 5.30 to six o'clock. Uh, I'd like to withdraw my, my uh, opposition to change the time. I think six o'clock is fine, as long as we can expedite our meetings uh, and uh, kind of maintain uh, some uh, discipline on our agenda. Uh, and secondly, the addition of the meeting on the 19th, I also would like to withdraw my objection to that. I think 6 p.m. is a good compromise. Um, again, if we find out it doesn't work, uh, we can always modify the time. Uh, yeah, we there 
it's possible to modify your regular meetings. You just need to do it with a 10 day notice instead of uh, the shorter notice that uh, other changes require. Um, so do we hear any more discussion of this? I just, I would like to put out the dates. So Dr. Powers did send us some dates. So I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so I think if we add the January 19th, that's next Tuesday, then I believe it was, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I don't have the other email up, but February 9th, just for purpose of the minutes, February 9th, March 9th, April 13th, May 11th. Now the June, I believe it was June 1st. Yes. Um, Dr. Powers, can you just tell why that one is on the first and not the eighth? End of the school year. Is it due to graduation? Um, it, it, it essentially is due to that's if we have a normal end of the school year, as opposed to the kind we had last year. <laughs> okay. uh, that is right in the midst of uh, the award ceremony time, getting ready for graduation um, and, and other factors such as that. So I think it would be actually be, uh, I don't think we've ever had a, um, a meeting uh, in June, much past the beginning of June. Uh, so it's a little out of sequence with the others. And that happens throughout the school year. Yeah. Sometimes uh, the second uh, Tuesday doesn't fall on a convenient time. Right. Okay, so I could say uh, June 1st is, um, oh, I lost my minutes. Um, the, and in April, would that, would I be indicating April would be the state of the school and budget address? It, it would be if we have the budget. Okay, so minimally I could put it in there. Um, Regardless, hopefully we could do a state of the school. And then um, some councils do put the organizational meeting on. Um, we, you know, it has to be between the 1st and the 10th of July, so. The, the, uh, form, the format that I have to uh, submit does not have a place for July. Okay, okay. So and I don't I will... know whether that is meaning that there is no organizational meeting because that's what oh. we're doing now. And the, 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 uh, my understanding was that the election of officers now goes through June of 2022. Okay, so my, mine was, I didn't have that understanding. I thought it was July of 2021, but for now, until we can get clarification, I'll just take that off. Um, I would think we, for high school specifically, we, we, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so just to restate the meeting dates are Tuesday, January 19th, February 9th, March 9th, April 13th, May 11th, June 1st, all at 6 p.m. And I'll make a note in the minutes that, you know, 6 p.m. is a compromise and that if, if it doesn't, if it's not working out, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit. Uh, pardon me, Sarah, would we have to take a vote on that? We will. Or I'm just reading it out, make sure we're all good, and then I'll make a motion. Okay. <laughs> is that, so everyone's good with that? Okay. I, I'll, make, I'll make a motion to prove the LSC dates as the Tuesday, January 19th, February 9th, March 9th, April 13th, May 11th, and June 1st at 6 p.m. for the 2021 LSE meeting schedule for the abbreviated term. Do I have a second? I can second, Kim. Ms. Bowman. Okay. And my vote is yay. I muted, I own a music school. There's a lot of piano going on, but I'll do a roll call vote. Um, roll call vote, Bowman. Yay. Boyd. Yay. Boggs. Yay. Cresswell. Yay. Hernandez. Yay. Hillbrands. Yay. Ma, yay. Martinsek. Yay. MacArthur. Yay. Menavar. Yay. Powers. Zen, I saw your lips move, Dr. Yeah. Powers. <laughs> Ms. Zen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that was 12 out of 12 votes for the dates as listed, as stated, excuse me. Okay, um, the next is announcing our first regular meeting and uh, as the previous vote, it will be next Tuesday, January 19th at 6 p.m. Um, okay. Um, and then we will move on to uh, Dr. Power's principal report. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. I wanted to keep this fairly brief, but there are several topics that need to be 
uh, updated, I guess, so everybody has a little bit of an idea of what is going on. Now that we have added to the agenda a discussion of the reopening of school, uh, that will be adding some additional conversation there. So I will keep my portion of it fairly brief. On our monthly reports, uh, I've gone ahead and included the attendance, which year to date is, is still pretty good. However, December was low and we're working on that simply because there were some reporting issues that put that uh, 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 percentage down a little bit. Uh, okay. For example, just some confusion over some of the um, um, reporting of attendance and so forth. So we're working on getting that cleaned up a little bit, which happens sometimes. Uh, our on, we still have had no disciplinary actions requiring uh, anything under the student code of conduct. Uh, we have our on track rate at 96.8. That is for all students nine through 12 uh, at the 15th week. Um, as was mentioned earlier, and we'll be discussing, I'm sure, in, in uh, a little bit uh, later in the agenda, uh, our diverse learners cluster program reopened yesterday. Uh, we opened with, out of our roughly 55 students, we opened with, I believe, nine yesterday. I'm not exactly sure what the attendance was today. Uh, all four of our uh, uh, low incidence cluster program teachers are working at school presently, as are the uh, the uh, special education classroom assistants, the SICAs, uh, and a number of other teachers who support the uh, cluster program through our ACES programming. We have a siren going by. It's not, not anything happening here, fortunately. Um, it's wonderful being right on the street in downtown Chicago. Lots of interesting things happen. Lots of noises. Um, in any event, uh, so uh, we do have, a, a for the people who are uh, assisting with the cluster program who are not actually part of that, they come in on an as-needed basis, uh, meaning they might come in one or two days a week, that type of thing, for, especially for our ACES program. Um, the uh, program is, is, I think it's off to a smooth start. Our preparations for it were very uh, careful and very deliberate. Uh, we are utilizing uh, classrooms primarily on the fifth floor in the South building, we do are using one other classroom that had more specialized setup on the fourth floor uh, in, the, in the South building. We're not using any of the classrooms in the North building at all. Um, and each of our, our rooms is carefully cleaned, uh, carefully monitored. Uh, if there is a mm -hmm. change in uh, students going from one uh, room to another, uh, those rooms are, are cleaned and, and uh, checked out uh, afterwards. Uh, and everything is cleaned extremely well uh, in those rooms uh, uh, at night after, after school is concluded, late afternoon and early evening. Uh, we have a system in place where each room is, has a door hanger indicating whether it's been cleaned or not. Uh, if it has been used, then it's the responsibility of the person who used the room to flip that over so that the, the uh, staff member or the evening uh, custodians know to clean that room. Uh, so we have off to a good start in that particular area. I'm sure there'll be some other questions and discussions about that uh, as we come forward. Uh, I will say one additional thing. We held two live uh, remote uh, uh, meetings with parents of students in the cluster program, uh, at which time students are in following up to that. Parents were given the option of either having their, their children continue remotely or participate um, uh, in person. Uh, we have our buses running, we have our care room uh, set up and staffed. That is in case anyone experiences any uh, uh, symptoms of, of COVID. And uh, that is a system-wide uh, room. Um, moving on to the, the next item in terms of uh, urgency, and that is the PSAT NMSQT uh, for juniors, which is coming up on the 26th. Uh, we are uh, right now looking at approximately 460 members of the uh, class out of a little over 500 members are taking the PSAT NMSQT. Uh, this is an elective uh, test for them. Not only is it practice for the SAT, but it is also the entry uh, method for the National Merit Scholarship Program. Uh, as I reported earlier, the class uh, earlier meeting, uh, the class of 2021, 20, uh, the current seniors, had a record 27 members of the class uh, become uh, qualify as semifinalists. Ultimately, all, virtually all of those will become finalists as well, making them eligible for scholarships. 
uh, for the number of students who are semifinalists or commended students, uh, they have that opportunity then to uh, go on in that program. And it's a great um, additional uh, feather in their cap, so to speak, uh, for their college applications. Uh, I need additional proctors. Um, we're operating more than 40 rooms, uh, everything from uh, one to one uh, testing for students who have certain accommodations, all the way up to uh, rooms. Most of our rooms will be 15 students. Uh, and we're following all the protocols in terms of health and safety, social distancing, and so forth. Um, we've already had two days of standardized testing in the fall, SAT in September and October for our current seniors. So we're well prepared for that, but this is a much larger number. Um, and we will be sending out communications to uh, our students with regard to a staggered arrival times, which uh, buildings they go to, uh, and so forth. Uh, so that's coming up. If anyone would like to volunteer as a proctor, it's very simple, it's very straightforward, it's extremely rewarding, and you get to spend about four hours with some terrific uh, Jones students. Um, if you'd like to do that, please contact uh, Tracy, Rayburn, uh, uh, Tracy Rayburn in our main office. She is our uh, not only our uh, attendance secretary or works in attendance, but also is our main person at the front desk there. Please contact her in terms of handling any um, uh, people that we can sign up as substitutes to come in because we don't have enough uh, staff to cover all of that. Um, with regard to the high school task force, the reopening task force, uh, this has been going on now for about a month. I've been a member of it. Uh, I came in after the, about the second meeting, I was asked to join in. Uh, this is representing uh, high schools throughout CPS. Uh, making plans for what it might look like for us to reopen school sometime uh, later this school year for high school students. Uh, all I can report at this time is that we are on a tight time frame for planning purposes. On, on multiple uh, models have been discussed um, and many other factors involved. Uh, we have a, the benefit of some of the work that was done back over the summer in terms of a hybrid programming, but we simply at this time do not know exactly when, nor do we know exactly how uh, school might be reopened or what format it might take. But just wanted to keep you appraised of that. We should know more in February. Um, I hope have something more to report in terms of detail. Um, we also have another uh, task force and that is working with selective enrollment high schools. And I'm uh, chairing that for, for Jones. Uh, and the Office of Diverse Learners uh, Supports and Services, ODLSS. Uh, CPS uh, has been part of a, a legal action going back many, many years called the Corey H. Case. And uh, one of the stipulations in the Corey H. Case is that each school have a, an, a number or percentage of students with IEPs that is the uh, equivalent of the percentage overall or the average overall for CPS. At present, the average um, overall for CPS is a little over 14% of students in CPS uh, at the high school level have IEPs uh, under uh, uh, the IDEA Act. Um, that has been going up, whereas in the sec selective enrollment high schools, the percentage has been going down slowly but surely. So the two are separating. Um, what we have at Jones is approximately 5.5%, I think it's 5.6. Uh, roughly half of that is our kids in the cluster program. The other half are students in the high incidence programming or uh, resource program. Uh, so the goal of this initiative by CPS is to increase the percentage over a period of four years uh, so that each of the uh, selective enrollment high schools has a percentage roughly equivalent to the percentage of uh, students in CPS. Um, that means for, C for Jones for next school year and starting just with the class of 2025, uh, we will have um, go from our present, well, I'll start in, in terms of the number of offers that were made. For students with IEPs for this current freshman class, 21 offers were made and we presently have 16 students uh, who have IEPs in the freshman class. That 21 is going to be increased to 52 uh, for next year. And I anticipate what we will have is a number of students with IEPs in the freshman class next year, 35 to 40, possibly higher. 
uh, just somebody muted me. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I, 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 I know I go on at times, but I'm trying to be as expeditious as possible um, in any event. Um, so that's where we are on that. Uh, our task force is meeting um, uh, regularly and developing plans. Uh, one of the things I'm very confident about with Jones is that I think what with the services we provide our students are top notch. Uh, the biggest challenge is going to be how do we uh, upsize the number of students and how do we handle the services that way? Not so much different services as just expanding the number of co-taught classes, for example, the number of students who need resource periods, that type of thing. So we'll have more information on that a little later on as well. Um, and I was going to recommend also for our next meeting, uh, for I was thinking in terms of February, but for the January 19th meeting, uh, I think it would be very appropriate to uh, have our community rep um, vacancy uh, addressed. At this point, I've been contacted by approximately, I think six people now. And once I have all their paperwork, I will forward that out to all the members. Uh, and then we can, uh, if, if the membership agrees, we will have it on the agenda, hear from those individuals uh, at the meeting and then vote on one person to fill that vacancy. Barring that, it could be done in the February meeting if that is so, uh, 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 um, if you're rather have it do it that way. Uh, also, um, we were planning for the February meeting uh, an update uh, on our equity initiatives. By that time, we will have had our first meetings of our alternative program, uh, which is a student uh, focused uh, program in terms of student voice. We will have had our first profession, our professional development from the uh, Davis Squared uh, consulting firm on anti-racism training. So we will have actually been able to make a start on some of these things we've been working on now for, for some months. I'd like to thank the uh, Friends of Jones for their financial support, which has been crucial in helping us to have a contract with Davis Squared Consulting uh, because we were not able to logistically do that uh, through Chicago Public Schools. Friends of Jones has stepped up and provided us with the funds to make that possible. Uh, and the other thing that happens in February regularly is the counseling uh, report, and that'll be Mr. Coleman, uh, talking about the class of 2020, the graduating class. By that time, we have uh, much more full information about what, where our former students are, what they are doing, um, you know, percentages in college currently enrolled, et cetera, et cetera. So those would be my suggestions as we prepare our uh, next agendas, maybe the community representative uh, on the, uh, uh, the meeting on the 19th of this month, and then the equity initiatives update and the counseling report uh, on the uh, first meeting in uh, February. Um, a few upcoming events uh, listed there, not nearly as many events as we normally have, and almost all of them are remote. Um, we do have, uh, like I mentioned, the PSAT and MSQT coming up. Uh, we have a holiday coming up on the uh, 18th, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, we also have semester exams on February 1st through the 9th, exams or student projects, and there will be a special schedule. Uh, and the fifth is our school improvement day, which is primarily for our teachers to finish up their semester grading and post their grades that day. Um, and then of course there at the bottom, we, we had the to be determined February meeting, uh, which would be now the regularly scheduled meeting from the 9th. And that includes, uh, concludes what I had to say. And if anyone on the LSC had any questions, I would appreciate we could talk about some of those now, or if they're involving the reopening, we can carry that to the new business section. Yeah, I think that sounds good. Uh, so definitely let's try to cover the, the non-reopening stuff in this section. Um, uh, I see Sarah wants to speak. Go ahead, yeah. Sarah. Um, yeah, I just had one, uh, one question that wasn't about the reopening, um, which was about the Corey H case. And so you mentioned 21 this year, was this the first year? Was, would we consider this year one? And then we have three more years? No, next year will be year one. Next year will be year one. So you got a head start. Right. Okay, so then, um, so if the, if the first year is 52, uh, I could do the math, but maybe you're not off the top of your head. How many students total are we looking at then after four years? Uh, well, we're trying to uh, 
try to get up that it's the percentage more than the uh, uh, the, the um, fourteen percent because the percentage varies or the number varies somewhat from class to class. For example, this year's freshman class is right around well, it came in at four seventy five. That's somewhat lower than that right now. But our junior class is over five hundred. Uh, so the aim will be to try to get that percentage up uh, for each of the of the years coming in. So for example, for next year, if I say our graduating class was 470, so we're looking at 470 or 475 freshmen, okay. then you know, the percentage will be set based on that or the offers will be set based on that. I see. So I make, that's also why it's over four years because you're Correct. each class, that makes sense. Um, there were early discussions of trying to raise it in one, in one fell swoop. It would have involved a significant numbers of transfers and so forth. That really was not practical. For something like this, it, it has to be done over a, a cycle and the four years is the cycle. And are you predicting that you would need to add staff to, like, as you said, continue to, you know, scale it up, but continue the, the wonderful services that you're able to, to give? That would be my um, heartfelt wish because <laughs> we lost two staff members in our high incidence programming uh, through the budget process last year. Uh, not our decision, but the decision by ODLSS. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm hoping we can regain those positions. Um, the biggest challenge is going to be having enough uh, high incidence uh, diverse learners teachers to cover the number of uh, classes we're going to have uh, where it's co-taught. Uh, and that will be adding additional general ed teachers who are already on staff as co-taught teachers. Okay, and I made notes for what you want on the agenda and I'll make sure that the chair uh, receives those. Thank you. Dr. Powers, I have a question. Um, thank you for your report. As it relates to um, MLK Day, I'm wondering at Jones, do you traditionally do programming to acknowledge that? We, we have, when students have been present, we've had a number of different things over the years. Uh, at this particular point, I don't know what, uh, uh, for example, our Black Student Union might be planning. Uh, or ideas that way. I have not, no one has actually presented anything to me. Uh, if there are things that come out to us that are say system wide uh, or coming from outside organizations, we will sometimes generate uh, publicity for that. Spread the word around through our faculty, for example, uh, when if there is anything like that is out there. But at this point, we're not, we don't have anything planned due to the, the, the total absence of students basically. Okay, just asking. I did send forth a flyer, and this is not a plug, but um, we there are organizations, we're doing something that is virtual, but I just kind of wanted to flag um, whether we're virtual or in person, if that can be something that administrations can take note of to address that, because it is a day of service and it's something that will be beneficial for all students. Thank that you. Would be a, uh, that would be a good suggestion because that's something that people then can, can seek out opportunities themselves uh, by promoting, you know, that that is a day of service. So we will definitely provide some additional reminders to people. And if we are able to uh, have any um, uh, specific uh, service opportunities, we'll pass the word on there. That's also very important for students who are International Honor Society, for example, and some other organizations that require service hours. And of course, our students are required to have some service hours as well for graduation. So thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. And I'll send an updated uh, flyer with the registration information. Um, and it's something that is virtual because of the situation. And it's for middle school and high school students. So I'll share it with you and the admin team. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. so, Madam Chair, I do have a couple questions for our, or two or three questions for Dr. Powers. Go ahead, Roberto. Uh, just to follow up with um, Ms. Elaine Bugg's uh, question about the Martin Luther King uh, celebration and recognition. Uh, would it be possible, Dr. Powers, if you could provide, if you can meet with some of the student organizations uh, and the uh, PPLC or any other uh, ILT to try to figure out what, what they're doing, um, if there are any, any plans in the work to celebrate Martin Luther King, and then also plans for Black History Month. Uh, as you know, that this country is, is facing an enormous amount of racial um, issues. Uh, and I think this is an important topic. And, and I would like to know what is Jones uh, doing proactively uh, to celebrate 
our black students, our black communities, or African American communities. Um, so uh, I would appreciate that if you could if you could provide us with that information uh, later on this week. Um, and then will, as far as the shop to see if anything is is going on and and report back if I do have if I do find out anything from faculty, staff, and other people. Thank you. Um, yes, and I would appreciate that if you could inquire. Um, and then I have two questions regarding the PSAT. You said there, there are 460 members that are going to take this PSAT MSQT. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, approximately 460 at this time. And, and what time, or what day is this? Uh, this is going to happen on the weekend or on the, during the workday? No, it's on Tuesday, Jan, uh, January the 26th. Uh, we've canceled other classes so that the students are not, um, you know, torn between going to class and going to uh, for the testing. And it will be between eight o'clock, roughly eight o'clock and noon. Students will start arriving. And then, at 30. My, my apologies, Dr. Barr. Um, thank you for that. And then um, for volunteers, uh, do they have to have a level one or a level two? Um, level, level two. Background. Right. Yeah. Level two. Yeah. Okay. And that's fairly quick and easy. Uh, if somebody does not have it already, uh, they can fill it out and it clears very quickly. And then my final question is regarding our diverse learners. I, I'm trying to figure out what is the difference. You mentioned that half um, when you were talking about the increase in the in uh, the cluster program, Jones is at the average of 5.5 percent. CPS is average is 14 percent. You said half of the Jones half of the Jones students who are in that group are in the cluster program and half are in the high incidence program. What, what is the difference between the two? Is the high incidence students in the cluster program or are they no. two separate programs? No, they're two separate programs within our overall uh, diverse learners uh, programming and department. Uh, the cluster program is uh, consists of students who do not enter through selective enrollment. They're placed here. Uh, we have uh, three classrooms. Uh, under normal circumstances, we still do even remotely, three classrooms of students with moderate cognitive disabilities and one classroom of students with severe and profound disabilities. Uh, and that's considered what's called low incidence, meaning it's the, the, the more, the less, less frequent uh, type of disability groupings. So those are our cluster programs. The high incidence uh, in, uh, disabilities are such issues as you know, specific learning disabilities, math disabilities, uh, a number of different things related to um, a pretty wide array of, of, uh, of issues. It could be students in the Asperger's spectrum, for example, but who otherwise academically perform uh, within the, the uh, <coughs> what I call the general education range. Uh, most of our students in that area or that division of it uh, are um, in all general education classes. They might have a resource period with their resource teacher as part of their uh, minutes for their IEP, uh, their individual education plan. Uh, they might also uh, be in a class that is a co-taught class where there is a certain percentage of students who have an IEP and the rest of the students do not. Um, the reason uh, for we're focusing on that is because our cluster program can't grow. We have a kind of a fixed uh, capacity for the cluster program, which is right around 55 students roughly. Um, and that's for pretty much where it's been for many, many years uh, because of specialized facilities and so forth. The growth will be in students who have uh, uh, other types of, uh, of IEP uh, disabilities, but are primarily in general education classes with supports. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Thank you. Okay, any other questions uh, for Dr. Powers on those other topics besides reopening? Um, okay, uh, and now I think we'll, uh, you know, we don't have some of our standard reports this month, um, but for our new business, we added a discussion of the reopening plan. Um, so uh, I think uh, there's, yeah, there's gonna be some people who wanna speak in public participation. Um, and so we, I, I think going forward, we'll be able to do some sort of 
doc to sign up to, to monitor the stack here and make it uh, smoother. But so tonight might be a little rough and I know these, these initial meetings might be a little rougher and slower, um, but I think we'll, we'll smooth things out as we go. Um, so uh, I think that would be helpful if, especially if we um, have teachers and students here um, or families in the cluster program who want to speak. Um, I think maybe the easiest thing is for people to put their name in the chat um, and we'll open it up uh, for some public participation now on reopening. Um, if you have some other topics for public participation, let's hold those. Um, the, the new business, I think, will be a pretty short discussion. Um, so uh, let's try to try to keep it on reopening right now. Um, and, uh, and you know, let's try to, it, it's seven, let's try to keep this, if, if you can kind of get yours into two or three minutes, that's very helpful. Um, uh, and yeah, we'll see, we have some, we have some leeway here. So let's hear, I think, uh, I'll, I'll Cassie, manage. could I, could I just make, yeah, do you have a suggestion, Sarah, on how to? No, I just, I just had a question regarding reopening based on the principal report. Um, and I think I see people putting them their names in the chat. Yeah, um, so, okay, so I think you're not gonna be able to do more than like eight people. So just keep that in mind. Um, I just had a really quick question uh, for Dr. Powers about reopening. He said that he did two live remote meetings with parents. Um, I thought that was interesting. If you could just talk about, was that like a meet, like a Google meet with those parents or was it more like a pre-recorded video? No, it was a live Google meet. Okay. Uh, we did one in November. I, I don't have the dates in front of me here. And then one about a month later. Um, okay. the, the first one was to kind of roll out the whole process so that people knew and they'd all, re all received things uh, directly from CPS as well and from the school uh, to determine so that they had a better understanding of what was going to be offered. Uh, and then they could make a decision whether they wanted their child to participate or not. And then the second time was to answer additional questions uh, see if we can move forward with regard to solidifying who the, the students would be, you know, how many we would have and so forth. And that was all done before the uh, winter break. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, if I, if I may, I think uh, to be respectful um, of our, our wonderful Jones teachers and educators and, and staff, um, I, I think we can, uh, I would propose that we allow the public participation to begin now, and then if the LSE members have questions, we should hold our questions to the end. I think that sounds great. Um, and so I think we'll try to just go through the chat here and you know, be patient with our attempts to not miss you um, in case we scroll away uh, before new people are posting. Um, so it looks like uh, Ms. Miller, do you want to lead off? Oh, do we have to, we have to, okay, great. Hi everyone, can you hear me? All right, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Caitlin Miller. I am the English department chair here at Jones. Uh, and I am also an associate delegate uh, through the CTU uh, here at Jones. Um, I am here to formally request that the LSE in next meeting, and next week's meeting um, discuss and vote on the current unsafe reopening plans put forth by the Board of Ed, the CEO and the mayor across the city. As of today, 46 LSEs have come together and written letters in opposition to the extremely unsafe and equitable reopening plans. As of right now, 39 out of 50 aldermen have voiced their concerns and opposition uh, to, to CPS's plans. Um, I have deep concerns about our cluster staff and students returning particularly as the rates of COVID in Chicago are at an all time high. Uh, in fact, today, one of our, it was found that one of our uh, staff member at Jones working in the building has tested positive. I am asking for the LSE to, to um, discuss and write a letter in opposition to the current reopening plan. This is an urgent matter as cluster staff has returned as of January 4th, cluster students returned yesterday. Most Jones teachers um, are, afraid to return. Um, the ones we've spoken to and surveyed, um, they're scared to return. They feel this, the reopening plans are unsafe. Um, and tonight you'll hear from other Jones teachers from across departments speaking to the need uh, for an LSE response as well as collective concerns around safety. Uh, I very much appreciate the addition of a January 19th meeting where hopefully 
uh, you can address this proposal. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, uh, I think the next person is uh, Jane Callen. And Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, hello, I'm Joan Callen. I teach French at Jones. Um, and I would like to voice my concern um, about the North building. Um, the fact that the classrooms, none of the classrooms, there's six floors, none of them have windows that open. Um, uh, we have been sent a link to show that the, the building's been checked out for air quality. But I would like to know, um, they, we were also told we were supposed to have a um, air filter for, for each classroom, which we don't have uh, apparently yet. But I'm also wondering, you know, how often would that be monitored? It, it really does, um, not just myself, but a lot of my colleagues, we are very worried about the fact that even when the air conditioning goes out, it gets very, very hot in there and the air is recirculated all the time. So it is a big worry for us in the North building as well as the challenges posed by the fact um, we are going to be teaching both remotely and in person. Um, as, a, as a teacher of French um, and, and all, all subjects, you know, best practices is to have the students working together. So my concern is how to have the students interacting at home with the students that are in the classroom. And that only really can happen if they are all on a remote a learning type situation um, with a device in front of them. So those are my concerns um, just as a teacher. Thanks, Ms. Callen. Um, uh, I think, uh, Daniel, are you up next? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, um, I would also like to voice my concerns for reopening as a student. Um, as a student, I know how hard like online learning can be sometimes but I, it kind of scares me to go back at the moment um, just because I, it's still, we're still in a pandemic and uh, it, it feels unknown. And my biggest concern is more with like transition periods and, and dismissal because those are always on like uncoordinated and hectic. And um, I see videos of like um, students memorizing about like when we were in, in the school actually. And like, it looks crazy because they're all so close together. And I'm like, I don't think that's really gonna happen in COVID. Um, but, uh, so yeah, those are my concerns. I would also like to deviate a little bit. Sorry, Ms. Kressel. Um, our SROs, uh, I just want to put that out there and um, the safety and security committee again, like, I don't know what's going on with that um, to like analyze like other situations and solutions. Um, but yeah, those are my concerns. Thank you. Um, so in the new business, we're going to talk about the bylaws um, and part of the bylaws is establishing committees. Um, and I think that is uh, definitely a topic that is needs to be addressed and we're gonna make sure that we have a committee that's working on that particular issue um, and those committees uh, it will as we will want the bylaws to incorporate that they can have students serving on them too so uh, just as some students served on the, the committees earlier this year so uh, we would love to have a student voice especially interested students like Daniel um, uh, okay, the I think it was uh, Megan uh, and you. Hi, <laughs> um, I'm Megan McClory. I teach AP Psychology in the Social Science Department. And um, one of the arguments that I've heard CPS saying a lot is that other schools have reopened and not shown to be super spreaders, not shown to be a problem. They've talked about schools in Europe and schools in other states, but um, there's no conclusive evidence of that. Um, there's inconsistent reporting and emerging data showing that the virus does not seem to spread much within schools if we're meeting four different things. Requiring masks, which we can do, social distancing, which we can do somewhat, but Daniel um, referenced the problems we might be facing, good ventilation, which Joan talked about our concerns about that, and community spread is low. And obviously community spread is not low right now. And also the problems, the issues with ventilation. I teach in the North Building, which doesn't have um, windows that open, but also the, the reports that they did, they did not test every room. Um, they tested them after they'd been empty for seven months. So any particles had time to you know, fall and be cleaned, whatever. And um, they didn't talk at all in the report about the, um, how often it gets exchanged with outside air. 
And that's true across the district. They didn't talk about that at any schools. For community spread, it's very high at this time. Um, currently in Chicago, we have a positivity rate of 10.2% on average with parts of Chicago being over 16%. And according to the CDC, if a region has over an 8% positivity rate, they're in the second highest risk of transmission from schools. And if we're over 10%, that's the highest risk of transmission for schools. So it has to be under 8% before we get to a moderate risk. And so the CDC's information is countering what CPS is saying and the current research is showing that there are issues with the current plan. And so those are some of the concerns that I would like to raise. Thank you so much. Um, I think our next person is Tucker. Okay, hi. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I, I'm Tucker Brown. I'm the Diverse Learners Department Chair and also a cluster teacher that has returned um, this week. Um, as cluster teachers and staff, we've been living under these thoughts of reopening since October. Um, it's literally been the most stressful time of my life. Um, as the Diverse Learners Department Chair, um, I feel responsible for the people um, in my department, um, both the teachers and my coworkers, the SICAs from the SEIU. Um, we've asked many questions. And while Dr. Powers um, has been very helpful, very supportive, um, many of the answers came back simply as, we don't know. Um, and that's been from the lack of information from CPS. Um, I do believe um, we all know it's not safe right now. Um, we are trying to make it as safe as possible, um, but that's just <laughs> as possible. Um, aside from the multiple uh, questions that have gone unanswered, um, really what the ultimate consequence of what we're talking about here is that even with our best efforts, literally somebody could die. I mean, that's what we're dealing with. I can't imagine suggesting we wanted to host any other event and saying someone might die. That would never happen. Um, I mean, we close if it's too cold just to be safe. Um, just as a look of what's happening, um, even with our best efforts, um, at school when kids come in the door now that they've been doing for a couple days before they come to school they pass their health screening um, when they get to school there's temperature checks there's signs everywhere we're trying to promote social distancing there's security teams there's plexiglass there's arrows and signs and these are for cluster students that have a hard time following these it's not it's not a good environment for anyone um, just an example of the classroom um, the first thing a parent asked in my first simultaneous session was if I could take my mask off so their son at home could understand me. And that was just, that was hard to do. <laughs> um, the last thing I think was already mentioned in my last class today, um, as I'm in class with 55 minutes left um, to teach, I get an email saying that there's been a positive positive case in the building. And I had to continue to teach knowing this in my mind. Um, it's just, it's been unbelievable. I would just ask that our LSC follow what so many um, others have done, um, acknowledging um, the danger that we're under and asking for at least a delay and reopening until we know um, that it's a better situation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. Um, and uh, I think uh, Cynthia, I think Monica said she could, was gonna speak on something other than reopening. Um, so I think we'll hold, put you on hold for a bit here, Monica. Um, and then I had Cynthia next, uh, Lil Legan. Hi, uh, I'm Cindy Lalagan. I uh, teach at Jones College Prep. I'm a CS teacher and a CS and engineering department co-chair. I first, I, I wanted to speak about uh, how unsafe I felt it was for our students to have to take public transportation. Our students come from all around the city as well as they have long travel times 
uh, because they come from all the different communities. Uh, but actually, I wanted to talk about something else when I, because as I was doing the research, I, I found out um, that this COVID-19 variant is, um, is, is um, a big new thing. And um, so on 1721 SIDRAP Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy reported that CDC officials told the Washington Post they suspect the mutant variant is present in most states and will become more common in the coming weeks. The variant is thought to be 50% uh, 50 more contagious than the strain that originated in Wuhan, China a year ago. On, on January 3rd of this year, during the Face of the Nation, former FDA commissioner and board member of Pfizer, Scott Gottlieb, um, said, well, we're not vaccinating quickly enough to create a backstop against this, the spread of this new variant. Right now, there's some estimates that the new variant probably represents about 1% of all infections in this country. By March, it's going to be the majority of infections. On January 6th, M WebMD Health News said that Ashish Jha, MD, Dean of the Brown School of Public Health, projected on Tuesday that as the new strains took hold in the US, they can cause an additional 10 million new infections by the end of February, and as many as 150,000 more deaths. Uh, as a side note, according to New York Times, the United States has had 22.3 million uh, and 300 uh, million cases and 373,000 deaths. So in six weeks, we could go up from a total of 22.3 million to 32 million cases and from 373,000 deaths to 523,000 deaths. Um, also reported in that same report was um, from the Imperial Co uh, College London fund that found that a greater proportion of children were infected with a new strain compared to the older version of the virus. It's not clear yet if these mutations make it better at infecting children or if younger people were just more likely to be expo exposed because kids had uh, have continued to go to school there even as many adults have stayed home. So I'm in support to um, not reopening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, if you guys have uh, specific links and written comments, um, uh, please do send them to uh, Sarah. Um, Sarah, do you have a specific email that you want to put in the chat for that? I'll put it in the chat. OK. Um, and uh, we will have a, a Jones LLC general email set up eventually. Um, I'll put mine in the chat to uh, which I just set up. So hoping I'm typing it right. Um, and then I think uh, Monica said she actually had a, a, a little comment on uh, reopening as well. So if you want to give a short comment on that, that's fine, Monica. And then we'll, uh, I think, open it up to LSE member questions. Uh, uh, let's see here. Sure. Thank you, Cassie. I appreciate it. Um, um, I just actually quickly, I, I actually came to speak on another topic very briefly, but um, I, I wanted to chime in on reopening as well from uh, the point of view of uh, being the Jones parent of a, a Um I did not come as prepared as some of you to speak, but in assessing whether the LSC will take a stand on reopening, I want to urge consideration of the tremendous not to be underestimated mental health and social and emotional toll as well as academic on our students of being home. I can't overstate that. And I'm gonna try not to cry when sharing that with you. So that's my first point about reopening. And my second point about reopening is just that I'm very sad that in this country, this issue has been so highly politicized and I would urge the LSC to make a decision on such a resolution that is not based on politics and not based on fear, which I'm very, very sympathetic to, but science driven and data driven. I, don't, I am not a master of the science or the data, um, but that is, but that is my simple request. Um, and then I don't know if I'll be speaking again. So I'll just mention very quickly, there's chatter. If we are going to continue in virtual learning for, and we are indefinitely for some period of time, that much is clear. Um, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Powers and Dr. Plunkett and the whole team for all of their efforts to make it as tolerable as possible. 
but it is extremely painful in a whole bunch of ways, some of which I have shared with some of the teachers who are on today, because you are my daughter's teachers. Um, and I want to say specifically that the e days, the break from screen time that that affords has been a lifesaver. And I have heard talk and chatter, and my daughter shared that with me today in the Jones community and I see one of the Jones students online nodding as I speak that the Eagle days are under threat from CPS downtown and I want to urge the Jones administration and LSC to stand firm in favor of Eagle days. Thank you Monica um, and then I think Ms. Harnett uh, is also on the stack. Okay, there I am. Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Yeah, uh, Jenny Harned here. Um, I am also um, a teacher in the North Building. I teach freshmen and I teach seniors. Um, I, a lot of the things that I'm concerned about were voiced tonight. Um, being in the North Building, not having access to um, air from the outside. I think we have four doors or four sets of doors on the first floor that do open where we can get some fresh air that come in. But obviously we would keep those closed throughout the day for security reasons as they open up onto the street. Um, in the five years that I've been working in the North Building, every single year, either our heating and or our air conditioning goes out for several days at a time. It's totally something we can live with when it's, uh, you know, uh, temporary and we're not worried about an airborne virus. But in this case, I just don't have any confidence in that system and <laughs> that air system at all. Um, and I am worried about that. Um, I'm also concerned that CPS is not including teachers in these in these plans, learning how we're going to do these pods. I can see how that might be able to work effectively at an elementary school level. I don't see how we're going to be able to just the high school level. And I, I would like more teachers to be involved in that process with CPS. Um, I'm concerned that if we do come back, what will it, this look like, right? Will this, how are we going to stream in all of our classrooms all the time? We don't have, um, you know, the routers in all of the rooms. And there have been times when I'm presenting in my classroom and if there are teachers in the classrooms around me who are also uh, streaming at the same time, a video, whatever it is, um, that it gets choppy and we lose connection and then we're not able to use that video, right? So if I'm gonna be uh, working remote with my students who stay at home and my students are in the classroom, I would hope that our quality of teaching would, would go up in the classroom. And I'm scared that that won't be the case, right? Between the remote kids and the hybrid kids who are in the building. Um, I could go on and on. I'm gonna write an email to the people who have given us their email addresses. I appreciate that. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that I, that I stood up and said something tonight and that in support as well of um, writing a letter against the reopening. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I want to reassure people this is not going to be like our only time that we ever talk about this. So that's, you know, for sure. Um, this is super important um, and there's a variety of opinions and it is, you know, really an issue. Health and safety is a big issue for the LLC. Um, uh, uh, Amy Fritsch uh, is also on the um, stack. Uh, and I, is that everyone on stack? If not, if, if you think I've skipped you, please put your name in the chat. Um, and Amy, go ahead. I just wanted to mention um, that I share all of the same concerns. I share deep concerns, especially with what Ms. Belogan was talking about regarding the potential risk increasing. Um, and simultaneously, we have our most vulnerable and our most uh, medically fragile students already back in a building that we know can't be made safe. We had, as Tucker said, someone sick today. Um, and we have a, a significant number of staff who for various reasons are also in very high risk categories. And the teachers who have put in across the district for ADA accommodations have either been denied outright or simply haven't heard back. And so the, um, the people whose health is at greatest risk are also not being uh, reached out to in response to duly submitted forms by CPS, which leads me again to really not trust that they have any of our best interests at heart. And so 
because anything else that I would say would be repetitive. The only thing I do want to repeat is that passing periods and every single student being in the hallway at once, even if we stagger passing periods, that then doesn't work in terms of getting kids to classes because none of the students share schedules with one another. And so like Jenny said, or which I, whoever it was, it could work in, a, in an elementary school where you can clump the kids. That's not the reality that we have. And that's something that Dr. Powers has been saying since the beginning about the difficulty of trying to do a pod with a group of students who are not sharing a schedule. And that was all I had to say. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm assuming the LSC has some questions now or discussion points. Um, uh, and so I'd like to open up for that. Um, Ellen, do you want to go? Um, I know it's hard. We don't have like a, we can use the chat as a stack for this too. Um, so it'd be great if we give everyone a, a chance uh, at least once to go around. And Ellen, go ahead. Thank you. I apologize for not stacking. And I appreciate, I think Joanne put some information in the chat about the internet situation, device situation at Jones as well, um, which can't be fully tested yet. Um, I actually had a question for Dr. Powers um, because you had reported that you're on the high school reopening task force. Um, and I was just kind of wondering what that looks like from like a Jones staff or parent standpoint, like should we anticipate um, a survey from you so that you get a like our perspective? I know we are not representative of all high schools, but I assume the task force includes principals from multiple different high schools. So I guess I was wondering, what does that look like for us? Like the plan to get in the voice of everybody who's at this meeting, but also people who are unable to attend at the LSC. I, I can tell you this, that there, there's a real wide range of discussions going on in basically every possible permutation and element of what would be involved in terms of reopening. Uh, everything from health and safety to curriculum to you know, scheduling and things of that sort. Um, at this particular point, I'm not really at liberty to talk about any specifics other than to say those are all under discussion. I do know that CPS will be surveying uh, high school families uh, to get their feedback. Uh, that will be coming directly from CPS rather than from the individual school. Uh, what we might do at Jones, and in, in, again, trying to uh, you know, mimic the, uh, the CPS approach in terms of the questions asked and so forth, is do the same thing with our own faculty and staff uh, to get a, a feel for that. So uh, it'd be best if we, if, if we know what the, the questions are being asked of people, if we ask the same questions are you know, adapted for our, for our faculty and staff. But uh, rest assured, we're going to be uh, exhausting uh, the whole process before anything moves forward. And I know it's a very fluid situation. Uh, you know, in, in one week, things seem to be much more hopeful. Other times, it doesn't seem that way. Uh, and all I can do is to, you know, take my uh, direction from uh, CPS, but work with all of us in our, in our school community uh, in the best interest of everyone. If I could just real briefly, two sentences with regard to Eagle Lab, there is indeed an issue with regard to Eagle Lab. Uh, and we're discussing that with the uh, ILT and we'll discuss it. Hopefully you have a chance tomorrow with the PPLC uh, just to uh, basically uh, outline the situation. We have an insufficient number of instructional minutes on Eagle Days. I shouldn't say Eagle Lab, Eagle Days. Uh, it was a great idea. It worked extremely well for our school, for our kids, for our teachers, for the whole, you know, I've not heard a negative word about it, except it's now been pointed out that we don't have the requisite number of instructional minutes, which have to be done every single day. We were, uh, we created Eagle um, Day on the premise that we were satisfying those minutes over the period of a week, um, because we have far more minutes of instruction on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday than is required. Um, what we had instead was, no, it has to be each day. So we are currently working on a plan which will still preserve as much as we can the benefits of the Eagle Day. And that will include especially getting kids and the teachers to some extent, but certainly the kids off the screens and give them uh, more independent time, asynchronous time uh, in the afternoon. 
Uh, we're looking at a couple of different models. Uh, we have sent out um, some surveys to our faculty uh, to get their feedback on which looks like it would work the best, but we have to get in a certain number of minutes each day. And that's, that's where we are right now with Eagle, Eagle Day. Um, we'll try to keep as much of that freedom, especially for our kids and getting away from the, the, uh, the screen as much as possible, uh, given you know, the directions that we've had. I have spent probably between five and six hours in meetings with everybody all the way up to the chief of schools um, and everybody's very sympathetic, but that's the rule and all high schools have to, and other high schools are facing the same kinds of um, revisions they have to make. I, I know that's just a nutshell. There's more than one sentence too, sorry. Madam Chair, I'd like to speak. Go ahead, Ms. Bynes. So I want to say, and I don't know that we've really acknowledged this, we have been experiencing a lot with the pandemic. And this is just a word of commendation to our administration, to our teachers, to our staff, to students and parents. We are weathering a storm. And even though it is challenging, and it is challenging, when you look at the level of attendance, when you look at the student on track success, the work that the teachers are putting in in these challenging times, I just want to say thank you. Um, I want to say thank you to the admin. You guys know I'm an educator, so I know this is not easy. And um, I just want to say I appreciate you. And it's my hope that things will get better, but just know that you are appreciated. And for our students, um, it is a challenge, but for them to still pull through the way that they are is, is just something to be um, recognized. So thank you. Thank you, and I really, on behalf of the, the faculty and staff, I really concur. They've done a tremendous job under very difficult circumstances and a lot of uncertainty. And that is one of the hardest things to do is to operate in, in a situation of uncertainty. Madam Chair, I'd like to be recognized. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Powers, um, uh, I have a couple questions for you. You mentioned that, um, or clarification. So for Eagle Days, my understanding is CPS is, is stating that students are required to have some sort of live um, instructional time Monday through Friday, five days out of the week. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. The, 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 what the format of it is that there is supposed to be 300 minutes per day of instructional time. Now on our other days of the week, we've got far more than that, but again, they did not accept the idea of that being spread out over the week or averaged over the week. Uh, what we're looking at is, and there was a something resembling a compromise, uh, the 300 minutes um, includes synchronous and asynchronous uh, instruction. Uh, what we've been told is we could shoot, we could, if we have synchronous instructional time for 240 minutes uh, for that Eagle Day without changing any of the other uh, schedules, uh, then we would have, in practical terms, basically school until noon. And the students are noon or thereabouts, maybe closer to 1230. Uh, and then the students would have the remainder of the day as asynchronous time. It would give the faculty and staff opportunities for staff meetings, which is very important for us, and also for our professional development. Uh, particularly given the, the commitment that we're making and the investment we've made uh, in our um, uh, professional development, the anti, especially the anti-racism uh, uh, professional development. Uh, thank you for that clarification, Dr. Powers. Uh, and then you mentioned uh, that you're working with as part of the, I, I believe, either the task force, um, the task force or the Eagle Day, that you're working with the ILT and the PPLC, can you can you tell me the um, uh, the difference between the two groups there, um, the IL2 and the PPLC, just for clarification? Certainly, and and we've had, and, and I think some of our teachers who are involved in this realize and know this, we've we we found ourselves kind of meshing sometimes functions, and it's difficult to keep some of the topics uh, discrete to the different uh, different bodies. The uh, ILT is the instructional leadership team. That is made up of the chairs of each of the academic departments 
plus uh, some other people, other staff, and of course, members of the administrative team. Uh, the PPLC is a uh, uh, mandated by law, uh, and it is made up of representatives of the faculty uh, to discuss issues involving a wide range of things, provide feedback to the administration, recommendations to the administration, not necessarily restricted to uh, curriculum, uh, issues involving, uh, in, well, things such as this, uh, you know, how can we best uh, proceed and so forth. Uh, but it is definitely uh, valuable to have uh, these bodies along with the PPC, which is the, uh, the union-based contract discussion issues. Uh, and we meet with all of those um, uh, on a regular basis. The IL team has been meeting more or less weekly to every two weeks and the PPC and the PPLC, we've been meeting monthly. Uh, thank you, Dr. Powers. And is there a col uh, collaboration, cross collaboration among the ILT and the PPLC? Uh, the main thing we've been trying to do is to, to, to delineate responsibilities because we were getting a lot of crossover. Uh, and that's just part of the reason for that is we did not have a PPLC functioning at Jones because there was insufficient interest on the faculty uh, to do so until about three years ago, I believe it was. Prior to that, the ILT handled a lot of those same issues. Now, since that time, the ILT focuses almost exclusively on instructional practice and instructional planning uh, and curriculum, whereas the PPLC deals with other uh, issues, more uh, what I'd consider to be uh, functional issues of the school, providing that, again, feedback and some valuable discussions. I just want to also add that there are members of the PPLC that are also serving on the ILT. So there is a, at least like cross collaboration in that respect that we have individuals on both teams at the same time. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Bowman and, and Dr. Parson. And then I'd just like to make a statement um, uh, to, to our, our Jones educators and staff and students. Um, I, it, this is a very difficult situation to be in. Uh, and I share the concerns that you have about bringing our students back in and reopening when I have felt that CPS has lacked transparency. I attended the hours long uh, committee meeting that uh, CPS or, or the alderman had on, uh, on, on Monday, I believe. Um, and it was evident that a lot of the questions um, they could not answer. Um, and that, uh, Dr. Powers, you mentioned about uncertainty. Uh, that causes a lot of anxiety and stress for our teachers and our staff and our students. Um, and it is an issue if CPS central office is, 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 it can't answer questions about their layered mitigation approach or the data that they're using to reopen the schools. Uh, it is a problem. Um, and I'm, I'm really concerned about that. And I also want to address, I believe, the parent, uh, Monica. The, you're absolutely right. You know, the isolation is very difficult for a lot of our students. I have a family friend who does have a child in the Diverse Learners Program and was planning on sending their child to the school because uh, this parent, uh, out of respect, I like to keep the family uh, anonymous, is that they work during the day. And uh, they work most of the day and there's only a couple days that uh, the family is at home and can provide that support services for the, for the student. Um, so I understand um, from uh, my own family, but also close family friends who are struggling with the remote learning. And I encourage and strongly encourage the uh, administrative leadership team uh, with the ILT and the PPLC to come up with a solution to help our students, um, to help our students to acclimate to the social emotional learning environment, this new learning environment that we're all in. Um, it can't be just about academics. It's that, it has to be about their, their mental health and wellness. Um, and if this means that we have to spend some money to get them some materials, some some material so that they can work at home with their families to build projects, then we should do that. We should really look into the budget to see how we can support these students at home, right? So that they can create with their families and not just sit 
on the Zoom or on the Google Lab. And let me be absolutely clear. Um, I have heard, and from my family's experience, that you are all doing an amazing job, right? And I am incredibly proud of being a part of this community and to know some of you very well. And I really, truly appreciate everything that you are doing. And you have my support uh, in order to support you who are supporting our family, our children at home. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and again, I encourage the Jones administrative leadership team to start creating ideas and, and how we can support these students at home. Thank you for that, Roberto. Um, uh, let's go to uh, Sarah uh, next. Hi. Um, so just give you a little background about myself. I was a chemical engineer in my previous life and have also worked a lot with HVAC and ventilation. And I'm just coming off of the Bell LSC um, where we have a lot of cons um, concerns about our air handling unit and the, te and the testing they did. And I, I put together a whole report of, and one of my slides, slides said why it's a sham. Um, so I, I definitely um, would like to get more information about the North building. Perhaps Dr. Powers could put me in touch with the building engineer um, and you know get as much information that CPS is willing to share with outsiders right now. They've really locked down what they wanna talk about as they're um, in their marketing campaign for re returning. So um, also to Monica's point, uh, again, I sat last week through a four hour meet LSE meeting. Uh, it was my last one where we talked a lot about reopening and at Bell, 70% um, of individual students said that they wanted to come back, which is a very high number. So I think that we should, that all our stakeholders should be reassured that the letter, we will you know, keep it apolitical and focus on things that we can ask for. Uh, and I just want everyone in the community to know that uh, we really have very little power, right? So we're just trying to do a resolution to say this is what we think uh, CPS could do. And one of the things maybe we're asking for is more autonomy um, so that we can make the changes in our school locally because um, we, you know, we know the building um, and we know the students and, and what we need. Um, and it sounds like Dr. Powers is already advocating for that as much as he possibly can. But at the end of the day, I think we all can agree that we can ask for autonomy and we can ask for solutions, but we're going to be given what we're given. And so how do we adapt that to meet our um, situation. Um, and then I had one more comment, which was about vaccines. Um, I know just to Michael, I think he put in about vaccines. I do know if you didn't hear about CTU saying that, you know, they were interested if all the teachers could get at least one vaccine. I think with one vaccine that would prevent um, death. Uh, people would, might still get sick. And we don't have information still to know that if you have your two vaccines, can you still be an asymptomatic carrier? So that's just something we, you know, realize that even if the teachers get vaccines, they'll still have to be masked in the building until we have that information. So I do feel confident that this council together with getting feedback from the community can write a letter that is representative of all the stakeholders. Uh, okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, Rachel, uh, that was on the stack next. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to say um, thank you to everyone who's who's um, shown up tonight to, to provide public comment. Um, I'm just recording like everything and just um, thinking about the, the wealth of knowledge that everyone who um, has students in the building or students remotely and is working in the building or working remotely has about Jones's unique situation. Um, and I think to Sarah's point, I just wanted to say, um, it's interesting to me that um, this past summer, um, the district um, gave uh, LSEs the power to vote on an issue that was um, in a similar way, pretty, pretty important, um, but is now, um, you know, we're talking about about these discussions about reopening um, and it seems like um, the LSCs are, are and the, the school community um, can come together with a lot of information about each specific situation. Um, so we're doing that, um, but I do wonder how we can kind of 
push um, push the ball forward for Jones specifically. Um, so I'm really glad really glad to be able to hear from everyone. Um, but I but I, I do think um, in light of all of the concerns that were brought up um, in this discussion, I would like to motion to um, have an additional meeting um, to discuss these reopening concerns um, in more depth and hopefully to allow more members of the Jones community to come um, speak if they if they wish if this time didn't work for them for whatever reason or they didn't they were unaware that the LSE was holding a meeting today as it is like the first week of of school um, so um thanks for that Rachel um uh, I think that'd be a good thing to discuss right now I think it's probably a little uh we should think about when um, that might be. Uh, so definitely, we still have a bunch of uh, council members who haven't weighed in yet. So we'd like to hear from you on reopening on the idea of doing a special meeting, which probably would be later in the week. Um, so go ahead, uh, Kim. I was just gonna say, um, this is like over two hours now. So I'm just trying to be respectful of people's time and I'm not gonna really talk a lot, but I just kind of want to motion that maybe that this should be an agenda item that we focus on on the 19th, since we already have that meeting planned in a week that we can discuss that and add it to the agenda item. I also wanted to put out there because of the time, I wanted just to make make a motion is that, I don't know if that's what I do, but I wanna do that to table the bylaws conversation till the 19th um, so that we can all get out of here at a reasonable hour. I second that motion. I second that. I, I think you don't need to table the bylaws until we get to the bylaws, um, since we're still in the um, the reopening discussion. But when we get to the bylaws, you can definitely make that motion, Miss Bowman. Um, <laughs> I'm not disagreeing. I'm just just saying from a point of order. Um, okay, and I really want to make sure that you know everyone's speaking up. Uh, I think we have not heard from Troy, Jose, Denaya, uh, Latrice. Um, and everyone has like various ways they want to be addressed. I'm happy to say Cassie. Um, and uh, if you if you have a title, let me know. Um, so we don't have to be quite level of uh, formality uh, at all times. Um, so just wanted to make sure we get some input here, um, especially about doing a special meeting in between now and the 19th. Um, and if you have other questions or thoughts on the reopening. I, I agree with Kim that uh, we should talk about it at next week's meeting. And I will also yield my time given that we are over two hours. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't really think we need a special meeting uh, in between now. Um, and the 19th, I think that that's a fine date, um, especially if we have um, a long list of things that we already need to talk about since this meeting is going a little long. Um, I don't have any extra comments about reopening. I would concur with that. Um, anyone else? Uh, input on this. Um, so I think the the motion that's on the table right now is to have a special meeting. Um, Rachel, did you say a, a date? Um, well, I was going to ask if I could amend amend my motion. Absolutely. I was going to amend it to um, to add an item to, to next week's agenda to, to um, uh, introduce a resolution. Uh, okay. I will second that motion. Um, okay, I, uh, Sarah, do you want to do the, or I guess I think we're, we're good for discussion of that. Um, open up one last time for discussion of that particular motion. The motion is to make sure that we have a reopening on the agenda for next week. Resolution specifically, she said she wanted to add. Oh, resolution specifically, sorry. And Ms. Bowman seconded. All right, let me get my list. If there's no discussion. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> it's a lot of notes. Um, let me find my list. Sorry. 
Okay, let me take a roll call vote to add resolution to next week's agenda. I don't, I technically don't think we need, this doesn't need to be a motion in my own opinion. Um, it's just something we're talking, Dr. Barnes is nodding. You know, it's it just, it doesn't need to be, we don't need to vote on this. We, you know, we're just saying we want it to be a resolution. We're gonna put it on next week's agenda. Um, and that will happen. Correct, yeah. yeah, okay. So we don't need to vote. Thank you, just to save some time. Um, okay. Uh, thanks. Um, okay. So our new business um, is a discussion of the bylaws. Um, I, I'm thinking that this discussion is actually that do people have copies of the current bylaws so that they can all read through it? Um, it's super important to get these uh, uh, in order so that we can form committees um, and we just really have a good framework for uh, how we're running stuff. Um, and so I would not like to put them off too long. Um, that's my, my advice as a chair. Uh, I will be very happy to get these settled. Um, so I think it's it doesn't have to be a discussion tonight uh, in more detail than that. Um, and yes, to a point from the chat, it would be great to get these publicly posted as well uh, so that the community can see them too. Um, and, it, you know, I am open to hearing what people uh, want to say about how to get these going quickly. Yeah, I'm, I, um, I wanted to say two things, which is, um, I have written bylaws before and I have Dr. Pars provided the uh, 2016 approved bylaws. I'd be happy to look those over with Cassie um, and see if there's, you know, glaring things we would want to change or add and then sharing that with the council for review before Tuesday's me meeting. So you'd have plenty of time to look that over. And uh, if that's okay with everyone, um, if anyone's objected, objects, <laughs> let me know. And I, I do want to make a comment about the length of the meetings. Um, we only meet once a month. Um, I think as a public body is you take as long as it takes to get the stuff done. I do think to be supportive to the community and their time that as an LSE will have a, a, an email where you can email your questions or concerns if you want to make a public comment. And that is at the beginning of the meeting. So that if you don't want to sit here through all the minutia of, um, especially this one was tough because organizational meeting is quite boring. Um, but that hopefully in the future we can um, construct the agenda so that it serves the community the best and then we can do all like kind of the formal businessy stuff at the end and everyone can log off. Um, I am fine having three hour meetings. I know I might be the only one, but if that's what it takes for us to get what we need to get done, because we only meet once a month, um, if, if that seems too uh, strenuous for people, I would meet every two weeks, you know, um, I, but I would, my fear would be that those every two week meetings would also be long. So <laughs> it's kind of picking your poison. Um, uh, thanks for that, Sarah. Um, I think uh, that also, I don't think we need to vote on that um, as well. And uh, I think in general, if we can, try to get reports and drafts and things uh, circulated like 72 hours ahead of time. That is super helpful. Um, and to the extent that uh, we can get stuff posted publicly uh, where appropriate ahead of time, I think is also super helpful in terms of, you know, getting people's input in a timely way. Um, and the placement of public participation on the agenda at like structuring that uh, timing can also help with people uh, who don't want to commit to the entire meeting, but really want to uh, give us some input. Um, so yeah, but I, I think especially as a new council, some of these are going to be long uh, initially, especially as we work out stuff. Uh, um, okay, uh, I think the rules of order will fall right under the bylaws stuff. So uh, I think the discussion there, it's kind of they're kind of one and the same because your bylaws refer to your rules of order. Um, and I'm happy to take people's input about rules of order uh, via email this week um, as we prepare. Uh, so uh, if people are good with that, um, I think our new business is done. Um, uh, yes. Um, so we can do another, uh, 
I did say earlier that our public participation during that section was supposed to be really reopening focused. Um, do people have other things? Um, great, um, Ms. Park. Um, so we can, we can take comments um, and uh, yeah, let's see who wants to say a few things. Uh, Ms. Park, you wanna go next? Hi, um, thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Heidi Park. I'm in the Science Department Jones. I am a member of a P the PPLC, but I wanted to speak today as an individual teacher. Um, I did want to bring up today the school's response to the insurrection and acts of domestic terrorism at the Capitol building on Wednesday, January 6th. Um, in the face of yet another unexpected but extremely traumatic event, Teachers were largely left to figure out how to talk to their students and how to navigate their classes on their own. Um, an email from the school administration acknowledging the events of the day didn't come until 8 p.m. after several teachers, including myself, had emailed asking for a unified response from the school. And a more thorough email with some guidance and resources didn't come until about 10.30 that night. As far as I know, there wasn't a school-wide message sent to families and students on the evening of the 6th to acknowledge that um, those events had happened that day. I do appreciate the latitude given to us as teachers to do what's best for our students in our classes. And I appreciate the resources that were eventually sent out. But I believe that as a school, we need a plan to address collective trauma when it happens. Um, this is not the first time that as a teacher, I felt like I was scrambling to figure out how to address a disturbing and traumatic current event in my classroom. I don't feel like I can gloss over these events, even though I'm not a civics or social science teacher and it's not directly tied to my content but I don't know if my students have had to unpack their thoughts and feelings about these collectively traumatizing events over and over. And I feel like as a school, we can and should do better by our students and our staff. Um, we hope that such events will not happen, but we live in an unfortunate reality where it is likely that something, uh, perhaps not anything like we've seen before will happen again. And it should not be up to us as individual teachers and individual classrooms uh, to figure out how to address and respond to this collective trauma. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Park. It's a, a super important topic this week. Um, and I think it echoes some of the issues that we're hearing about with mental health in general, uh, due to the pandemic, due to the remote learning and due to anxiety about returning in person. Um, and the political context is a huge part of that. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is part of why we need to to get everything shaped up. I, I think that uh, having a, a committee that is working on uh, health and safety, um, especially that having that include mental health uh, will be really important. Um, and so that, that's something that I would definitely like to see as a chair uh, because I think it's just huge right now. Um, Cassie, if I could just respond to that. Uh, the administrative team worked all evening uh, that day, uh, putting together not only the information that went out uh, just in terms of acknowledging what happened and guidelines to try to help the faculty and staff uh, deal with that in interaction with their students, uh, but also to provide specific uh, lesson uh, and other reflective materials, particularly information that we received from uh, MICVA, the MICVA Challenge uh, Program. So I do take exception to what Ms. Park said. We worked on that for hours in the evening and uh, something like that is not an off the shelf ready, ready made item. Uh, and uh, we did everything we could to get that out. And the next day got the additional information out uh, to faculty and staff, uh, more, more data or more uh, lessons uh, that we found uh, that might be useful forwarding them during the morning and, and, and into the day. And then finally making sure we had out a communication with all parents and all families. So uh, we did act on it. We acted on it expeditiously and we spent a great deal of time uh, being prepared for that and doing the best we could. Dr. Powers, I have a question. Um, do, is there a, like a crisis team that's in place that can be activated to uh, provide like additional support? Um, or counseling, social work, or something like that, so that if this happens, you all have some support 
and supporting the teachers and staff members? When there is a need for a uh, crisis response, we have uh, numerous resources from CPS. Uh, CPS did not make available any C uh, additional resources to us with regard to the incidents last week. Uh, so we basically uh, went ahead with what we would normally have done uh, as part of a crisis team. But in that particular case, uh, yes, we do have uh, those resources available to us whenever they are called upon. Okay, but that's from CPS, but not within the school as a team? Basically the crisis team in, within the school is the school administration and other support uh, individuals within the school. Uh, for example, if something has happened, such as we have had uh, a few incidents in the past where there has been uh, a threat of some sort, uh, the crisis team goes to work in terms of how to handle it, what to do with the students, what to communicate, right. uh, not only to the students and staff, but also to parents. Okay. We've fortunately that's what I not had too many things like this. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's just been, this has just been, last couple of years have been a lot of crises. Thank you so much for clarifying. Okay, I don't see any more requests in the chat. Um, so I think going forward, it's gonna be helpful to have some of our agenda discussion for the next uh, meeting uh, at, the, um, at the, the end of the previous meeting. Um, we do have a couple things that we have put on. Um, so community rep um, and uh, a reopening resolution. That's what I've heard so far. Um, and, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. May, may I make just one comment, please? Yeah. Uh, so I, I just wanted to address the length of this meeting. Uh, so this was the annual organizational meeting uh, where we've nominated um, various uh, officer positions. And then we had a discussion regarding Ms. Creswell's uh, nomination as chair. Uh, I believe there was an opposition to that. And so then we had a discussion about that. And then this was also a discussion about reopening the schools. And we heard from nine uh, uh, Jones educators. And so this is an incredibly important discussion that we must have, or at least I take that very seriously um, because as someone mentioned, lives are at stake. Uh, so nine of our Jones teachers and staff spoke and we gave them that space and opportunity so that they can express their concerns for themselves, for their families, for our students, for our community. So uh, I just wanna reiterate that this was for them to uh, uh, address the reopening plan and some of the deficiencies in the reopening plan. Thank you, I yield the floor. Uh, thanks, Roberto. Um... Yeah, I do want people to keep in mind as we talk about the next meeting uh, that uh, a lot of these CBS LLC reopening meetings that have gone on around the city have been very lengthy. Um, so if we're gonna put our reopening discussion uh, and our resolution discussion in the same meeting, I think we can expect a, a meeting longer than this one. Uh, so if, if that gives people uh, a second thoughts um, and maybe a special meeting is preferred, I, I think we can, we may wanna I would entertain any motions around that if, if people or thoughts because I, 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 mean, think, I think people, after. Cassie, I think people should sleep on it and get back to you. And then if you feel like you want to call a special meeting, you can work with Dr. Powers and, and find a time. Um, but I, I think it's good to have some space between now and then just thinking about uh, what that might entail. But just so you know, I was in a now this is just for the cluster program, but it was in a four hour meeting <laughs> uh, that wasn't for a cluster program, it's for the whole school. And it, uh, and that involved parent feedback. What we haven't we heard from one parent tonight. So just something, just something to think about. Um, I think the big meeting, and I think Dr. Powers is is preparing for that, is is when CPS gives him the plan in February, and then that will be probably another um, lengthy session. So. And I can add there. I don't know that we're going to have anything by February, but whenever we do. Uh, we'll be bringing that out to the uh, to the school community to the LSC. Uh, okay. Um, 
do people have other just items that they would like to see on the agenda for the 19th that they'd like to bring up now? Um, I think we can expect to, uh, you know, we'll have a PPLC report, we'll have a principal's report, we'll have a student report, um, and uh, we should hopefully uh, be able to hammer out these bylaws and have a vote on that. Um, so, but if there's other things, um, and I want people to keep in mind that uh, members of the community can also suggest a, a agenda items. So, you know, certainly re reach out to the chair of the secretary on that. Um, and, you know, it really is the community's council. So, you know, we wanna hear from this whole school community and make sure that we are covering the stuff that's of interest. Um, and I think as we get committees set up, that will also facilitate input from a lot of different people um, and meaning that not everything has to happen in the full LSC meeting, um, but it will still be addressed. Uh, so let's keep that in mind as well. Um, so any more agenda item discussion? Uh, great. I think right. Ellen just asked about, oh, Sorry, yeah, she just asked oh, if sorry. the community oh. member vacancy is gonna be on next week's agenda. Yeah, I think it makes sense for next week. I think that's fine. We put, I think the, the ad got posted last month, um, got a lot of interest. So we have a lot of candidates to consider. Um, certainly anyone, you know, you know, who is living in the boundaries, uh, which is North Avenue to Cermak, the Lake to Western, can put their, their name in uh, with a candidate statement. Please email that to Dr. Powers um, ASAP. Um, and yeah, I think that is definitely, we can take care of that next week as well. Sorry, it's like really hard to notice things in the chat when I'm blabbing, so. Should I make a motion to adjourn the meeting? I would be happy to entertain that. I second that motion. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, I, I don't know if we really vote on that. We do. Really? Yep. Yes, okay. I'm um, ready. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. okay. Roll call vote. Uh, Bowman. Yay. Boyd. Yay. Bugs. Yay. Cresswell. Um, yay. <laughs> Hernandez. I saw him in there. Mr. Hernandez. Hillbrands. Yay. Ma, yay. Martinsek. Yay. MacArthur. Yay. Menavar. Yay. Powers. Yay. Zen. Yay. Mr. Hernandez, one more time. Yay. Okay, yes. thank you. That was uh, 12 yays, zero were nays, and meeting is adjourned with 12 out of 12 votes. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank Good you night. all.